Dungeons and Dragons has always been a way to connect friends, build worlds, express your creativity, and create stories and memories that could last a lifetime. Though, it has always come with the crippling downsides of inadequate scheduling arrangements and drifting distance. Luckily for us, we no longer live in the 1970s. We are blessed with the age of technology. D&D Online is one of the best ways to circumvent the issue of scheduling and distance. It's even how my group of socially distant hermits were introduced to the game. With D&D Online, there are many applications you could use to enhance your experience. Foundry, Roll20, Avery, or that weird Chinese software that started sending you propaganda. But out of all of them, my personal favorite has always been Tabletop Simulator. That's not to say it's the best. While every one of these applications has their upsides and downsides, I believe Tabletop Simulator gives one of the most immersive experiences for your players. Today I'm going to teach you about running D&D on Tabletop Simulator. This video will hopefully familiarize you with the mechanics of the game, importing models and other basic features. If requested enough, it will be followed up by a part 2 containing tips on refining your use of the application, improving your experience as a DM, environmental storytelling, and using miscellaneous tools that we won't cover today. So be sure to subscribe and comment down below if you'd like to see that. Starting off strong, a flaw and strong argument against working with this system is that unlike other systems mentioned previously, Tabletop Simulator isn't built for running TTRPGs. Typically, most players on Tabletop Simulator are spending countless hours playing eels and escalators, so you aren't bound to run into diehard groups as you would with Foundry or Roll20. That's not to say, of course, that it's a poor application to use. When starting a game, there are many board templates that you could use. I prefer using this one here, since it's the first one that appeared on the workshop five years ago and I even searched for a better alternative. But like my 2013 Honda Civic left in the projects overnight, I stripped the board of all its useful stuff to give it some space. You don't have to, but if you're using D&D Beyond or an outside PDF to keep track of your player stats, these really only serve the purpose of bugging out when you switch the maps or being subject to the curse of the repeating letters. As for this, well this and this, I use those pretty much all the time, so I'd recommend keeping them. Before starting off, I recommend changing the permissions so that your disgruntled player whose NPC you killed with an at one doesn't flip the table or draw dicks on the board. Now as for the feng shui of the board, like other applications, importing maps and figures is as easy as it comes. So much so that you'll practically find everything you need already put on the workshop. The community having spent thousands of hours of their life doing it for you. I recommend this workshop add-on here because it has basically any prop, item, or map that you might need. But for those looking for something more specific and to your taste, the steps are simple. Step 1. Lurk Reddit, Pinterest, Google Images, or Stock Shen, Pekus, or other creators' Patreons for maps specific for your needs. Just make sure to pay, and save it to a common folder that you know will be easy to find. Here's mine. Number 2. Choose a default board from the objects and import your image. And number three, repeat until you successfully crafted an area that you'd consider yourself satisfied with. When starting a campaign or building a new area, I tend to create folders with specific map saves to make it easier to locate and organize region-specific areas. To lock a map in place, you press L, right-click and lock. To optimize space, you can use the pro Goshi Wan strategy of cramming everything very close and meticulously, using this tool here. Just make sure to lock before you move it. One issue you might have is that the board snapping and moving around, making it difficult to place. For this, you could simply lock and use the before mentioned tool or right click and turn off snap and grid to make it easier. Doing this could give your players a very Baldur's Gate-esque experience in a large town or settlement, getting to roam freely in towns and checking out cool shopping locations at their leisure without the struggle of loading multiple map saves. Just make sure to put Hubble Law in practice and turn up the play area so that you don't send Major Tom flying off the map. As for models and pieces, the workshop has thousands of props, characters, models, and effects that'll really make your campaign's 3D setting feel alive. They don't have everything you can ask for, but luckily for you, I found a pretty simple way to bring custom models into the game, which I'll explain a little later, as it is quite a bit of work and deserves a section of its own. You could easily search through the models by entering the game's tab and going to the workshop and using the search feature. This is especially useful for those on-the-fly encounters, events, or things you might have forgotten to do during pre-session prep. Just make sure to place it in a fog of war before showing it off, and don't worry, we'll get to that. 
I also recommend going inside of the workshop pack first so that it doesn't take your PC three years to search for a preview. Unless, of course, it's the one that I uploaded. Since I am an unoptimized bastard and I'm too far gone to fix it, if you want to take the risk of opening it yourself, I can run it, but be warned. Your PC will run slower than your first laptop after downloading 40 Minecraft mods off of a shady Turkish website. As for the pieces, you can copy and clone them pretty easily by right-clicking on the models and either using Control v or Paste, or pressing left-click after the cloning is prepared. We'll get more into that in part two. You can also colorize the models in the same menu, but for really special and strange creatures, if you want to give them a bit of flair, you could right click, go to custom, enter material, and play around with the different specular colors and strengths to really get a cool effect going. Just make sure and keep in mind that this will only work for models and not asset bundles. Along with this, you could weld models together and create a weird homunculi or Frankensteinian monster. To create copies of creatures you found in the monster manual but couldn't find a model for. Using the move tool from earlier could help with specific placing. You can shrink and grow models with plus and minus and if a model isn't small or big enough for your liking, after hitting its cap you can morph it easily with these gizmos or doohickeys. Fog of War is easy, and you have two options. Option 1 is the convenient Fog of War Zone, which will keep peaky players from seeing the map before you're ready to reveal it. Or my personal favorite, the hidden area, which will allow you to colorize and show specific players areas that you want to keep hidden from the rest. This pales in comparison to the other more dynamic fog of wars found on Foundry or Roll20, though there is actually a slight solution for this. If you're willing to go the extra mile in dungeons and low light areas, you can turn down the light settings on the board, using the workshop's torches and other lighting effects to illuminate the player's vision. Though this will also make you a victim of the I have dark vision player. For them, you could give a toggleable little light orb to make them feel super special like a little goober, or illuminate the map slightly on their turn. For all of this, I recommend making use of the saved objects feature, which will make grabbing effects, important NPCs or other player characters extremely convenient. The backgrounds are another great feature. Changing the backgrounds will give your players a true feeling of foreign travel when entering a new area. There are also plenty of pre-saved maps on the workshop that you can yoink the background from. By searching those workshop add-ons and pressing the background button, you could fit your setting with some very dynamic effects. Finally, the rough one. If you're extremely dedicated to the craft, you could take the challenge and try importing very specific models into your game. Step one is simple, find an STL or object that you want to import. Many people use Hero Forge, which allows you to purchase the object for printing and easy access. Personally, I like to search Thingiverse for some really obscure and interesting things that could fit my region. If you're adept with modeling, you can create your own figures from scratch, but I wouldn't have any clue how to do that. I'm a dirty asset masher, and I use this guy's content a lot, and I really recommend subscribing to his Patreon, this guy's awesome. I've used it for like 99% of the models on my workshop, and I know many of the other people have too. He's a fantastic modeler, so give this guy some support. Step 2 is importing the STL into Blender and changing the size to 0.04, which should work for most models. I recommend testing it out though and see what works best for you. After that, make sure it's centered and export the object as an object. Step 3. Follow Tabletop Simulator's guide found on their website. I'll leave a link for that down below. You'll need to install some sort of GitHub thing in a very specific type of Unity. It's, it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass to figure it out, but you'll, you'll be alright. After Unity is set up, drag your object here, create a variant, add a 3D collider by right clicking, go to 3D and pressing this, and then name that sucker and build the asset bundle. Once that headache is done, open tabletop, import asset bundle and go to the folder and boom, you have your custom model. I have yet to figure out how to make the asset bundles objects and I'm kind of a troglodyte, so like many great NPCs I'll simply give you this sword and send you on your merry way in search of a great tutorial that'll help you figure that out. If all that sounds like it sucks and it's boring, I don't blame you. Learning this was grueling but awfully rewarding and simple to do once you get the hang of it. 
As a final point, there are some bugs that come with using Tabletop Simulator you should be aware of. First off is the before mentioned letter curse. When using these sheets, players will sometimes accidentally write over their information with a repeating letter. To fix this, I recommend giving the players a bag that they can keep their character pieces, props, and anything else you'd like to give them, so that it sticks around every time you load a new map. The second major bug probably won't affect you, but you can still fill your cloud save. If you personally import more than 10,000 items, including boards, asset bundles, and backgrounds, though I doubt you'll ever reach that cap, simply make another Steam profile and family share. It'll keep your map saves and all your other valuable assets away from the Steam Cloud's corrupting clutches. Well, that's all for today. Remember to comment down below and subscribe if you want to see that part too. I still have some ideas and tricks that I can share that'll help you run your game in Tabletop Simulator. If you want some DM tips and tricks while watching some smooth animations, consider checking this video out here. Or check out our podcast to see Tabletop Simulator in action. And catch us next time when we talk about... Well, I haven't quite decided. It's either between beans and monsters, so I'm going to release a poll alongside the video to figure that out.